Um, yeah, I would, um, as I say, just to, to start with, I'd just like to um, uh, to thank you all for uh, for being here. There, there is uh, competition um, for the um, um, for the um, uh, for the side events today. There's uh, so many side events and, and so little time. Um, uh, just to advise that we have had um, uh, some people who have asked to um, uh, to uh, or who wanted to be with us today but aren't able to make it. They've asked if they will be able to um, catch up later, and indeed they will. This event is being recorded. Um, it will be posted online. The link will be um, circulated. Um, uh, other things to just to some of the um, logistics of it. Um, this is a meeting, it's not a webinar, and that's down to my personal prejudice. prejudice. I don't like webinars. Um, and um, so we've got me as the moderator, we've got, um, uh, we've got some speakers, uh, designated speakers who are going to kick us off. But apart from that, we'll be operating um, largely as, um, as, uh, well, as equals. Um, you will have control of your camera and your microphone, um, but please wield that control responsibly. Um, the uh, microphone for you know, normal rules, microphones often less speaking. Um, but if you are speaking, it would be nice if you could have the camera on so we can uh, we get to see you. And um, you can use the chat box. Um, you can raise your hand to uh, to get yourself in a, in a speaking queue once we move to that uh, that part of the um, of the uh, of the event. Um, and if I'm missing you for some reason, then just start waving your arm, put the camera on, wave your arms, shout, whatever, um, and we'll make sure that you um, uh, you get to say your piece. Um, this, um, uh, what we have, the, the report that we're, uh, that we're launching today is, is part of a Safer Worlds um, ATT expert group um, project, which has involved a series of, um, uh, we're down to years. In fact, there's a series of smallish group meetings from government um, and uh, non-government representatives from all regions who would just come together to discuss ATT issues and try and advance a, a, a positive um, ATT agenda. Uh, though, as, as everything these days, these meetings are currently online. Um, the project uh, at the moment is funded by Germany and Switzerland, for which thanks. Um, and um, that's, as you can imagine, that is much appreciated. Um, and we'd also like to thank, or I'd also like to thank the Netherlands for co-sponsoring today. Um, we are launching our report, uh, which is entitled Domestic Accountability for International Arms Transfers, Law, Policy and Practice. And I will um, uh, put a link in, in the chat box um, once I've finished, uh, once I've finished speaking to that report. Um, this is the eighth report um, by the um, by the um, uh, by the expert group process, um, and you're welcome to explore all the others. And again, I'll put a link to those um, in uh, the in the chat box um, shortly. Um, now, this this report is a bit different to the others that we've done, um, and its its origins come from 2019, a roundtable that was organised by the Global Legal Action Network, Oxfam, and us, Safer World. Um, and that was in response to uh, what was a, a growing number of legal challenges to arms transfers. And we thought it was possibly time to, it might be time to take a, to, to, to gather the people involved in all those together, compare and contrast the different challenges to think about um, the implications of those transfers. Um, and, um, and, you know, what, we wanted to gather everything in one place and, and just see what story what story did that tell. And also, in the context of the arms trade treaty, what that might mean for the arms trade treaty, and also what the ATT might mean for um, uh, for these legal challenges. Um, so um, we um, so that's when it began. But we the report started earlier this year, um, and. Um, uh, it has definitely benefited from the input of a lot of different people, including those who are directly involved in the challenges that we look at. Um, and it's been also been reviewed by a number of very clever international lawyers, so we're very grateful to all of those um, people. We covered 
10 cases. Now, when I say we, um, it's a report of the Global Legal Action Network and the International Commission of Jurists and Safer World. Um, and we cover 10 cases, um, nine of which are um, in specific domestic jurisdictions, six in Europe, two in North America, one in Southern Africa. And we also look at the request, the current request to the Office of the Prosecutor um, of the International Criminal Court to investigate whether actual individuals, um, either working for companies or officials, involved in, uh, in transferring or not authorizing transfers, um, is um, whether they might be criminal, criminally liable for contributing to war crimes. Um, now, um, the way we're going to run this today is we will start with um, uh, some introductory remarks from Sabine Visser, who is the Deputy Coordinator of the Arms Control Unit of the Dutch um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and um, uh, she will, uh, she, as I mentioned, the Netherlands is co-sponsoring, so she'll make some introductory remarks. We will then hear from uh, Vito Todeschini of the, um, of the ICJ and from Valentina Azarova um, from, uh, from the Global Legal Action Network, from GLAN, um, and who is also a report co-author. Um, and they will speak to the report in general. Um, then we've got uh, Hans Lamerant from um, Redesakti, and apologies Hans for my, uh, for my, my pronunciation, and, um, and Attila Kiesler from the Southern African Litigation Center who will talk about specific cases. Um, and they'll be talking about the Belgian and South African cases, um, respectively. Um, we'll then move into discussion mode. Um, and um, we will, uh, I'll, I'll certainly see if anybody's got any questions of you know, specific clarification after each presentation, but just clarification and we'll, otherwise we'll save um, everything for the, uh, for the discussion um, to follow. Now, um, rather obvious, it becomes rather obvious that um, Yemen is at the is at the centre of this report. All the um, uh, all of the different challenges are about um, supplying arms into the Yemen context. And I, I think something that is um, extremely important to remember at this moment is that um, Yemen has not got any better just because. Afghanistan has got worse, and because Afghanistan has, for obvious reasons, stolen a lot of the, the kind of uh, attention and the oxygen, um, Yemen is still a, a complete humanitarian disaster zone. Over 230,000 people are still dead and counting. Violence is a constant threat. Um, here on a daily basis, there's just been missile ex explosions in Sana'a. Um, a missile and drone attack on the Al Anad military base a couple of days ago left 40 dead. Um, it's all, violence is also happening at a micro level, in, just in communities, even in families. Um, a colleague of mine um, uh, who works on Yemen described the country as a system without a state in the north and a state without a system in the south. Um, conditions for civilians continue to deteriorate. The South is becoming more fragmented, the North is becoming more radicalized, and there's no sign of improvement anywhere um, down the track. So um, it's, yeah, so I think um, we need to remember the context. People's lives have been destroyed, and that supplying ever more weapons into that space is just making things worse. Um, and this is why, um, despite um, all the challenges to, to um, taking things into the legal realm, which and we'll hear about those challenges. We've got dedicated activists and lawyers from around the world who've, who've resorted to pursuing these legal avenues to present arms transfers where other approaches um, have failed. Um, that's plenty from me. Um, I think um, now if I can hand over to Sabine uh, to just make a few uh, introductory remarks on behalf of the, um, of the Dutch government. So Sabine, it's all yours, thank you. Thank you, Roy. Uh, good, good afternoon, good, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, it's great to be here. I may start by thanking Roy and his team from Safer World for organizing this event and inviting us to participate. We're very glad to participate in today, today's event. 
um, because we believe it's important to start conversation in the ATT about how the ATT is applied in practice. Uh, we believe that the most effective way in doing so uh, is by discussing concrete cases in which the ATT is applied. Today we're talking about cases that are being or have been litigated, uh, making them by definition difficult or litigious, but also high profile. Um, it makes it a bit difficult for state parties to discuss them. Uh, for example, I'm not allowed to talk about cases that are currently uh, before the court. Um, so difficult to discuss, but not impossible to discuss, and moreover, very necessary to discuss. Um, as implementation is a national responsibility in the ATT, uh, and without a clear multilateral enforcement or dispute settlement mechanism in the ATT, accountability about how we apply the ATT must be given um, in the national courts, national parliaments, and in the courts of public opinion. In the Netherlands, we've consistently felt that this accountability through feedback, conversation, and indeed court cases with all stakeholders, um, be it NGOs, parliament, media, or industry, who also take us to court, um, have made us more critical in our choices and have improved our policies. Um, even if these conversations, as they frequently do, end up in an understanding to agree to disagree on the final decision on whether or not we authorize a transfer, we always leave the conversation a little bit wiser and a little bit sharper. Uh, so we very much welcome the opportunity to join the conversation today, uh, answer any questions regarding the Dutch case that you might have you know, that is discussed in the paper and learn from your question, analysis and recommendation. I look forward to the next speakers. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sabine. Um, uh, we've just had a question. Um, I think I mentioned at the start, yes, this, um, we are recording the event. We don't have the link to that recording yet, but once we have it, we will be circulating it amongst people here, but also we'll be circulating it um, uh, more widely um, as well. Um, so uh, now if we can uh, start looking at the the content of the report, and we will start looking at the content of the report. Um, and first to speak, and um, and first of two looking at the report in general, will be uh, uh, Vito, um, legal advisor at the at the ICJ. Um, he's been there for almost four years now um, in the MENA program, focusing on Libya and Palestine, Israel. His expertise um, is in international humanitarian law, human rights law, and uh, law on the use of force. And I uh, Vito is going to uh, focus in his presentation on domestic accountability and international law, which, as you'll see, is the um, is section two of the report. Um, so, uh, Vito, it's all yours. Thanks, Roy, <clears throat> and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So, as Roy was saying, I <clears throat> will discuss the international law part of what you find in the report. And then uh, Valentina will take over. And in particular, I would like to discuss the relevance of domestic accountability processes within the arms trade tr treaty, the ATT regime, and the ATT's interaction with other branches of international law, uh, specifically international human rights law and international humanitarian law, which is the law of armed conflict. Uh, in particular, I will touch upon three issues, which is the relevance of such processes to the implementation and enforcement of the ATT. Then I will look at the question of accountability under, for human rights violations and uh, crimes under international law. And then I will finally uh, touch upon the connection between the right to remedy and challenges to arms transfers. So starting with the question of the ATT uh, and its implementation, the first uh, like observation is that the ATT does not establish itself an international oversight mechanism uh, mandated with monitoring and enforcing the ATT. Uh, instead, we have under Article 17, the establishment of a conference of state parties, which is ongoing at the moment, which has limited monitoring functions, we can say, especially through the initial report that states parties are uh, supposed to submit regarding their like legal frameworks concerning uh, arms control and arms sales. 
and the annual reports that state states parties are supposed to submit regarding the export and the import of arms in the preceding year. So this, if we can say monitoring function is basically, basically done through these reports. So we can see it's rather weak and there is no mandate for the conference on state parties to enforce the ATT obligations if there is a breach of the ATT by states. This means that domestic administrative oversight and or judicial review becomes central to the ATT proper implementation and enforcement. And this is like uh, shown through the various cases that you will find in uh, the report. And in this sense, when we talk about the domestic accountability processes, uh, the relevance of these processes, we can see that this is one of the junctures that we have between the ATT where it closely connects with international human rights law and international humanitarian law, where also these domestic processes are very important. Uh, we know that obligations under uh, international human rights law and IHL are already considered in articles six and seven of the ATT, where we have the prohibitions on certain transfers or the requirements of assessment for trans arms transfers that uh, might possibly lead to the commission of human rights violations and crimes under international law. But when we look at the ATT implementation, it's also necessary to look at what states' obligations are under international human rights law and IHL regarding accountability. This is because and especially uh, arms transfers, as we know, may make and exporting states even complicit in human rights violations and crimes under international law, and therefore responsible under international law. So when we look at what these branches of international law impose on states, the kind of obligations, we see that, for example, states under international human rights treaties have an obligation to criminalize investigate and prosecute serious human rights violations, uh, particularly when we talk about torture, enforced disappearance, extrajudicial ex executions, and other violations. But also we have IHL treaties like the Geneva Conventions, their protocols, or even customary IHL, and the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court that also impose on states' parties an obligation to investigate and prosecute crimes such as war crimes and crimes against humanity, for example, or genocide. And these obligations uh, to investigate and prosecute also extend extraterritorially. So we have to look at the action also, they encompass the action of states beyond their territory. And this also includes, of course, if these violations happen through arms transfers. So here it's clear the, and, and important, if you want, the connection between the ATT, the obligations under the ATT, and the obligations under international human rights law and uh, IHL when it comes to investigation and prosecution of crimes. But also we can look at other important obligations of states, particularly when we look at the question of uh, the action of businesses and companies, in this case, arms exporting companies, uh, that are by definition non-state actors. In this case, we have like detailed obligations uh, that come from like variety of sources, like the, the we, we find this obligation described in the UN principles on business and human rights. We find uh, the same in the general comment number 24 of the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And also in an important document, which is the Maastricht Principles on the Extraterritorial Application of Economic and Social Rights, where we find described what states are supposed to do to, if you want to control uh, the, the, the action of uh, companies that might result in human rights violations or even international crimes. And I would like just to uh, remind of two 
specific duties of states in, in that sense, which, which closely connect to arms exports, which is, first of all, the duty of states to ensure that companies, businesses that are uh, domiciled in their territories or that, that, that have their like main sites, main headquarters in their territory or with which there is a close connection. So a duty to ensure that these companies don't engage in or assist human rights violations and crimes under international law. So we can talk about the duty of oversight over arms exporting companies. And also there is a second important duty, which is uh, to provide access to justice for victims of human rights violations that are committed or facilitated by arms exporting companies. And in this case, there is a duty on states, for example, to remove barriers for victims to access courts in their territory. So here we can see that how accountability plays out in terms of uh, investigation and prosecution of crimes, but also oversight over the action of those companies that export arms. And these are also domestic processes that are especially relevant to the ATT. Uh, and now I would like to move to my third and final point, which is also connect to the last um, issue I was touching upon, which is access to justice. And the third point is about the right to remedy uh, under international human rights law and the con its connection to arms transfers and challenges to these transfers. So the right to a remedy under uh, international law is central to the regime of human rights law and is recognized by all principal UN and regional human rights treaties. For example, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights or regional instruments like the European Convention on Human Rights, the African Charter and the American Charter, the Arab Charter and so on. So it's so important that it's recognized in all treaties plus other like, for example, guidelines by the UN. Uh, now, the right to a remedy has two dimensions. One is procedural, if we can say so, and it's the necessity that states provide victims of human rights violations with, with access to courts or review bodies that can provide redress for the violations. And then there is a substantive dimension, which is the question of reparations. So states must provide reparations for human rights violations. And when we talk about reparations, we have different kinds of, which is restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, satisfaction, and guarantees of no repetitions of the violations. So it's necessary that states uh, provide remedies that have both these dimensions, but also it's very important that these remedies are effective, which means that they must be accessible, enforceable, and capable of providing effective redress to victims. So this is the general obligation under human rights law regarding the right to remedy. When it comes to arms transfer, a specific, if you want, very important element of effectiveness, of, of the effectiveness of the remedy is transparency and access to information, right? Because states must require like, sorry, must provide access to licenses, dealings, transfers, and, de and decision-making processes that concern the export of arms. And why is that? Because this is, this is like, these are necessary elements for any interested party, for example, an NGO, to challenge an, arm, uh, an arms transfer, to challenge uh, a license when there is especially a breach of the ATT and even in absence of necessarily a violation of human rights law, but just a breach of the ATT. But it's even more important when we talk about victims instead of human rights violations. So when an arms transfer like leads to the commission of a human rights violation or a crime under, under international law. So it's very important that victims have access to the necessary information to challenge uh, a transfer in a, in a state court and also to find redress. So I would like just to conclude before like uh, 
giving the floor to Valentina uh, to, I would just like to restate the fact that again, domestic accountability processes, the ones that I uh, briefly described are central to the ATT implementation and enforcement. And we have to always keep in mind this connection that we have between the ATT and international human rights law and IHL, which also help to reinforce this regime and its enforcement. So I will conclude here and uh, yeah, give the floor to Valentina. Thanks. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Vito. Um, we obviously, we started late, so we'll crack on quite quickly, but just the, the thing that occurs to me, especially that last half of what Vito was saying about the um, uh, access to justice. When you look at the cases, there are a number of different impediments to access to justice that come up, which I think might be worth exploring a bit more when we get to the discussion. And so unless anybody has a specific um, question of clarification for, um, uh, for Vito, um, we're, going to, uh, we're going to move on. Um, Okay, and I think this, um, there's, a, there's a mention in the, for, from Jeff in the chat, and I, th I kind of think we'll, we'll come back to that, Jeff, I think, in the, in the conversation. Um, oh, yeah, the other thing I should mention is I have put in the chat now those links to the report and also to the, the broader um, ATT expert group um, uh, project. So, Valentina, to you. Thank you, Roy, um, and thank you, Vito, for setting up um, the discussion on the report. I will share this just for the benefit of those key points that, that Rito had made uh, being there and building off of this overview of the broader normative environment for the ATT, for ATT-based uh, domestic accountability in international law. I'll cover the purpose and significance of the report, um, its key findings, and what conversation we hope to animate amongst legal practitioners um, and NGOs, as well as between these and other key uh, ATT and international accountability stakeholders, namely states and international organizations, about the significance of these domestic um, dash transnational legal processes for the implementation of the ATT um, and the enforcement of cognate international law. In Okay. There are two starting points uh, that we use for, um, for this investigation, for this research um, that was done collaboratively uh, and, and um, as we mentioned, started a, a couple of years ago now. Um, one is the perspective that conflict-linked arms supplies um, and the legal infrastructure that enables them, namely domestic licensing systems, condition and cause some of the most serious violations in Yemen, Libya, and other protracted violative conflicts. Uh, remarkably, these may be seen from um, the perspective of the international law and state responsibility as illegal situations, because in many cases, they're based on serious breaches of peremptory norms of international law that require all third um, party states to, uh, to, to uh, abstain from assisting them uh, their, in their maintenance. Um, and uh, of course, in, in that regard, European uh, companies and exporting licensing governments are, are implicated, uh, at least in the situation in Yemen. The second starting point is, as Vito um, discussed, the, is the access to domestic judicial oversight proceedings being um, a necessary dimension of the implementation and enforcement of the ATT in the absence of international mechanisms and in the absence of an established practice by other international bodies to which, to which, um, we, we, which we discussed briefly and I will return to that point at the end. Um, so this is based on two, on two broad categories of obligations that Vito discusses. One is the responsibilities of states not to assist in wrongful acts, and two um, is the responsibilities of states for the consequences of assistance in wrongful acts. So the ATT is really uh, comes center stage in relation to both and is an important preventive mechanism in this broader universe. Um, so it's certainly also a necessary facet of uh, transformative uh, justice and accountability for war atrocity in both ongoing and post-conflict situations from the perspective of victims, 
again, as Vito discusses. So against this background, we took um, in the collaborative research uh, that, that we've undertaken uh, to uh, consider the practical experience of ATT implementation uh, through domestic proceedings, uh, in which critically um, there is an incredible variation from one state to another, which in most cases uh, don't give domestic judges um, the right to review directly the conformity of government decisions with the ATT, but rather do so indirectly by ensuring, ensuring conformant interpretation of domestic laws. So, um, as Roy mentions, the report looks at past and ongoing proceedings in nine domestic and one international um, jurisdiction, and that's the ACC, I, the ICC, um, uh, before which submissions, a communication and further submissions were made against government and corporate officials in four European countries, um, some of which have overlapping ongoing domestic proceedings. Uh, this. The accounts of the proceedings are based on semi-structured interviews, a review of court documents, uh, meticulously uh, done, uh, uh, particularly by Carlo, um, and follow up with country experts um, who informed the thinking and the analysis throughout. The key, one of the key purposes of the report is to provide an initial taxonomy, um, which you see a sample of here of the main patterns of access barriers to effective domestic judicial oversight and accountability for breaches of domestic uh, laws implementing the ATT, uh, as well as other international and regional laws that are sometimes mentioned in the proceedings. So very briefly, just to mention some of the examples, we find that this ver variation in the availability and quality of such proceedings really signals a remarkable disparity between different arms export control regimes, um, the kind the ATT had intended to redress uh, by creating an equal playing field. Um, and these are some of the regrettable trends we observe in seven of the jurisdictions where proceedings have advanced or are ongoing. Um, in terms of procedural barriers, we have um, critical uh, barriers to access to information um, and the ability and blocking, barring the ability to uh, get to an administrative court in Spain, for instance, including no information about the scope of licenses in Belgium, for instance, and we'll hear more from Hans, I'm sure. There are material jurisdiction barriers um, such as political question doctrines in France and most probably as will be the case in the US, which of course is not a state party. Um, there are further standing uh, challenges for NGOs more broadly. These are really, I, I would say the procedural barriers are entry level barriers and obstacles of the minimum kind uh, that Vito has uh, observed uh, really need to be removed to enable proper judicial oversight and full um, implementation of the ATT, and a range of substantive barriers, of course, um, that the ATT contemplates in permitting states to implement um, the ATT through national uh, laws, and of course, based on the ways in which uh, administrative, uh, civil and criminal proceedings take place in said state. Um, so there are variations with regards to the scope of review, um, the nature of the proceedings, some being closed where material is unknown, cannot be challenged. There are repeated indication of blind challenges, um, not knowing uh, where uh, uh, arms are being delivered to what, to what units, um, or not knowing the duration of, uh, of licenses. Uh, the scope of review being uh, primarily procedural uh, in terms of reasonableness or rationality rather than a substantive, as noted, in terms of the rules of the ATT. Um, and uh, uh, not all licenses are covered um, and so forth. Uh, so there, there are many different aspects of, of the various proceedings uh, that can be brought up to illuminate this disparity, which again, we argue uh, is the very kind of um, redress uh, through an equal playing field that, that the ATT was meant to provide. So we have three claims I will try to, or, or points with a, with a forward-looking um, 
perspective uh, that, that, that have practical consequences, I think, for states and international organizations um, that, that maybe can animate our discussion uh, uh, today, but also are very much the, the one of the key purposes uh, uh, for this exercise so far, which we also imagine continuing given that, that many of the proceedings are. So one is that uh, uh, one of these claims that we make uh, in, in the report, um, which does not provide a, a very lengthy analysis of each and every proceeding, but rather it, it is taking an accumulative view, um, is that the judicial oversight role of courts is necessary um, as a form of effective implementation of the ATT. This is the basic claim that we keep repeating today and that there are certain obstacles, certain barriers that must be removed. Again, the procedural barriers being um, those uh, a case in point. We argue that judicial oversight is imperative to ensure the robustness of decision-making on licensing and perhaps in some cases is the only form of post-export control um, that is available at the moment, while yet, um, these arguable forms of denial of justice through the excess barriers that we've mapped out uh, reveal the ability of states to control and undermine such crucial uh, transnational legal processes, which are in fact the only um, international institutions for the ATT as things stand. Secondly, um, of course, given the uh, lack of an international mechanism, dedicated, dedicated mechanism for the ATT, international supervision, um, through human rights courts, through political bodies, uh, through the corporate accountability standards and soft mechanisms that Vito discuss are all uh, very much wanting, uh, but underexplored and perhaps a, a, a perspective. Um, so there is much more to be done. The, the UN group of eminent experts, which is expected to do, uh, um, to, to repeat its call on states to end um, arms sales to, to link with the Yemen conflict uh, in, in the meeting uh, next week, once again for the fourth time, um, is, is also taking a, a careful view of the, of, of, by questioning the legality of, of such transfers, but not being able to uh, uh, provide a clear uh, statement of uh, the responsibility that such states uh, bear, at least in international law uh, and not, of course, as a matter of individual responsibility, which is, of course, a, an issue for courts to take on. And finally, um, as a matter of, uh, uh, from the perspective of justice and conflict, and uh, specifically in relation to some of the established arms supply relationships with parties to the Yemen conflict, um, uh, given the significant contribution of those have made to, to the conditions, causes, and prolongation, prolongation of the conflict, um, we we uh, uh, hint and, and hope to continue a discussion uh, in which these relations and of course the instruments, the, the defense cooperation agreements that structure them are analyzed as part of a conflict um, of the responsibilities of conflict promoting actors. Um, and of course, also uh, of their uh, key role in accountability. Um, during and after conflict, uh, including through uh, creative state-led compensatory schemes, which have been uh, proposed elsewhere. So let me leave us with, with one fundamental question that uh, we, uh, uh, in, in putting together this report um, and, and in, in, in finalizing it, continue to contemplate, and that's whether um, whether the general implementation of the ATT uh, through deference to states, um, for one, uh, uh, the most states continue to conceal the most basic information about licensing um, and trade in arms uh, that, that inhibits and bars recourse to domestic proceeding, um, whether this uh, state of affairs uh, is indeed sustainable, um, is, is a, a uh, acceptable um, in terms of uh, the full implementation of the ATT. Um, and of course, uh, given the role, the critical role, the transnational lawyering, civil society, the representatives of victims and victims have played in, um, in animating uh, proceedings that are key to its enforcement. Um, so thank you, and I look forward to the discussion.
Thank you uh, very much, Valentina. Um, and I was uh, very remiss, wasn't I? I should have done a slightly better job of introducing Valentina there. So, um, uh, so Valentina is actually a founding member of the um, Academic Practitioner Collective, the GLAN, Global Legal Action Network. A lot of experience, 15 years of, uh, of international legal experience with a focus on the Middle East. Um, currently a visiting lawyer at Swansea University, a research fellow at uh, the University of Manchester, and uh, also uh, uh, guest teachers on other programs. Um, uh, and certainly she left us with a, a good question to ponder at the end there. Um, but um, is, does anybody have any kind of very specific questions of clarification to, um, uh, to Valentina at this point? No. Nope. Okay. Well, then we will um, crack on. And so now we've we've had the big picture. Uh, so now we're going to look uh, much more specifically um, at a couple of cases. Um, the the Belgian case, which has been going on for a long time and has gone through a number of iterations, and the South African case, which is much more of its of its formative or early stage. To speak to the Belgian case, um, we'll hand over to uh, Hans Hans Lamerant, who's a researcher, legal advisor for Veridaxti. Um, and who is spending most of his time on research and strategic litigation on the arms trade. Hans. Okay, maybe a first clarification. Uh, Vredesaxi, the organization, is translated as peace action, so that makes it a bit more easy to understand, probably. Um, but the, so the legal challenges we are doing around uh, the Yemen war is also in cooperation with a couple of other organizations. Uh, one is the League of Human Rights, um, and the other one is CNAPD, which is an umbrella of uh, these organizations. So it's uh, not something we do on our own, but with a whole group of uh, organizations. Um, it were administrative, of it are administrative uh, or proceedings before administrative courts against uh, licenses, against let's say the, the governmental decision to to license. So each time we have to uh, focus on those specific uh, decisions and challenge them before an administrative court. Uh, important also is that the legal framework is not just the ATT but also the EU law framework, the common position with its own criteria. And those criteria are, in Belgium at least, implemented in uh, the regional uh, 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 regulations or the uh, regional decrees on arms exports. That's important because it's one of the uh, elements which play also in uh, the court cases. If we, uh, in the report, four um, challenges are um, covered. In fact, it's about two sets of applications uh, for, for export. The first challenge uh, is uh, one set of decisions which were made in 2017, uh, which um, got partly suspended, and the other part didn't got suspended because the court was in general too late to make a decision which still had some effect. The second, or the, the second, the fourth challenge, um, all concern uh, decisions made uh, or started to be made in uh, 2019, but where there were several subsequent decisions after each time after suspension, the old decision got withdrawn and a new license was given. So it's in that sense, it was each time against a new decision, but it all concerned about uh, the same material. Uh, which already shows the sort of legal uh, problems we had. Um, if we look to the court decisions in those four phases, we see that the court each time suspended exports or suspended licenses, um, but it's evolved in its decision making. In the, the start, it was a purely formal procedural check. It checked if uh, all criteria were evaluated, like the first challenge they had some at least not explicitly evaluated, uh, or in the second challenge, they had um, neglected a negative advice. In the, the later challenges, the court is, was also looking in the more substantive reasoning uh, of that evaluation. So it looked if the facts at hand could uh, yeah, reasonably be uh, 
uh, did not contradict, let's say, the motivation or the evaluation the, the government made. So although all decisions concerned the formal motivation in the latest decisions, it was really like, how can this decision be coherent with the facts we have here at hand and that really looked into evidence of Belgian weapons being present in Yemen. So the basic legal uh, element considered was are uh, those weapons, um, is there a risk that those weapons are going to be used in Yemen and in that sense in a war where there is clearly um, violations of international humanitarian law taking taking place also by the actors to which we are exporting at that moment. So that's the element which is, uh, there are a lot of arguments being used, but that's the element which has been each time considered as a reason to uh, suspend uh, the exports. Uh, important also, it's um, urgent procedures. So that means that not all legal aspects have been thoroughly uh, considered, but the court picks the argument where it says, okay, in this basis, we can make in a short evaluation, a decision which is uh, valid enough to suspend um, this decision. That's also um, an element which plays on that legal context. So the decisions have each time been based on the national law. While there have been discussions about the applicability of ATT and of the common position in sense of are they direct applicable in uh, in Belgium or not. Uh, the administrative courts generally refuses to apply that, but there are other courts which do. So there is a mixed uh, jurisprudence on that level, which is not clarified yet. Um, but it's clear that based on the national law, um, that there a thorough of evaluation is made and that can be asked to uh, the judge. Um, if we see to the problems which we had in those uh, decisions, uh, the first problem was how efficient is the procedure? Like if you look to the first challenge, um, in pra practice, a lot of the decisions came really too late, um, which also helped uh, later in the sense that the court changed its uh, stand in terms of accepting an application for an urgent procedure. Like the first challenge, it was refused. In the later challenge, challenges, it accepted. The difficulty is more or less involved also in pinpointing the, the decisions, uh, also because it was obvious that the government was more or less trying to hide which uh, license it was given. Um, but for those urgent procedures, it was at least possible to make, um, uh, to obtain legal decisions in time when there was still, um, which still had an effect on exports, which uh, later, which, which were still ongoing or could go on. Um, from that also developed um, another practice of the government, which was to once an, um, uh, license was suspended to withdraw it, to retract it, so sort of uh, annul the decisions themselves, which also meant that the suspension was not valid anymore, and they made a new decision, a new license, uh, where we could not obtain information about or not fast, uh, very fast, but which we each time had to challenge again. Uh, so we get a sort of game going on of um, Licenses giving, we find out about it, we go to court, the license gets suspended, and then uh, the whole game starts over again. That's the reason why we come now to four to court, uh, three court decisions in a row about the same material. And there will probably in the future have to be a fourth one as well, because I'm suspecting that there will be a new license uh, hanging. Um, this is also linked with that the problem of the fact that they, the court only makes decisions about the formal motivation and not about actual, the actual facts. Uh, to the, um, if the court would say these facts don't allow uh, a license to be given, the discussion would be finished. 
now it still leaves the option for the government, in theory at least, to make a new decision to motivate it or try to motivate it more properly and export again. In practice, it's almost not possible, but that um, allows the game going on, which means that the exports are going on in shorter terms, but in the periods between the licenses getting given and the suspension. Um, and that means all the material is getting exported, but never on a legal uh, license, always on a license which later on gets uh, suspended and withdrawn. So we, we, there we really have a problem of um, yeah, access to an effective remedy, like we have access to courts, but we don't get it uh, very effective. The further problem is information, like um, in general, we don't get access to uh, information or especially not in time to do an effective uh, court case. And the, the government is also trying to play with it by, by effectively hiding uh, as much as possible the fact that the license has been given. So when we try to use access to information, uh, we don't get any information. Um, even during the court cases, we get at that moment um, information about the existence of licenses, but we don't get anything of the motivation or the advice given, which means that our lawyers have to shoot more or less in the dark. Uh, try to develop some arguments on what we assume the license is about. And if we, if we hit a target, the license gets, gets uh, suspended. If we're wrong, then uh, the license gets approved. That's one of the problems, like what in the report is called the third challenge. Like at that moment, um, one license or one set of licenses got, got uh, suspended, but another one not because the element which uh, played uh, there was to which military unit is the material going. Um, the Saudi National Guard is a unit which has been seen in Yemen and which has also been observed with Belgian uh, military material in Yemen. And for the material from one set of licenses, the ones to FN, that was clearly for the Saudi National Guard. For the second uh, set of licenses, there was a discussion, and the company now says it's only for the for the Saudi Royal Guard, which is not active in Yemen. Um, we think they're lying there uh, a bit, but the main problem during the court case is we only know that uh, at the moment when the pleading is done, and at that moment we can't raise new arguments, or we read it in the verdict. So uh, we always are in that sense too late to, in, in terms of factual information. The fact that the Saudi Royal Guard has a human rights record inside Saudi Arabia, which is not really the most, the nicest one, they're clearly involved in internal repression. They're also the unit which is more or less the death squad of the crown prince, like uh, they were clearly involved in the Khashoggi murder. These are all sorts of arguments we couldn't raise in that court case, but which are now brought up in the, let's say, the final, the annulment procedure, but there a decision will only be uh, made when all the material has been gone already. So there we come out the effectiveness uh, problem again. Um, so basically, we, we get we have legal standing in Belgium compared to other countries that's quite um, um, handy or unique position in the sense that's been a fight which has been gone uh, several years ago but you see that the other uh, elements to create really domestic accountability also mean uh, procedures have to be effective and you need information to uh, to act on. Um, otherwise, you can't really create some serious uh, account accountability and also um, make sure that there is a sort of uh, independent check of how governments uh, handle those criteria and make the evaluations. Because we all hear the nice talk about we use the highest standards, but the ones a court actually checks they suspend. <laughs> so there is clearly um, 
a problem with those highest standards, uh, especially when it concerns export to Saudi Arabia and, and the war in Yemen. I will leave it to that. Roy, I think uh, you're just, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you very much for that. I think we're starting to get an idea of just how procedurally difficult some of this can be um, and different jurisdictions seem to have different tricks and, uh, tra uh, uh, tricks and traps for, for, for people. Um, I'm going to go now to a much newer case uh, in South Africa. Um, and we're going to hear from uh, Attila Kisla, um, uh, who is the legal consultant, Southern African Litigation Centre, and who is leading on this South African case. Um, and uh, has also, in fact, um, a little bit of a Dutch connection here, has um, been involved in the case of uh, Hus uh, Pauenhofen. Uh, not sure how good my Dutch pronunciation is there, um, but who was um, convicted in the Netherlands of illegally supplying weapons to the Charles Taylor regime and complicity in war crimes um, and was sentenced to 19 years, but is uh, in South Africa and trying to avoid extradition. And I believe uh, uh, Attila has been working on that. Um, but uh, so Attila, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Roy. Thanks for your invitation, Safer World and Roy. Um, well, I have the privilege to speak here today about the uh, South African case. I would like also to point out that my uh, colleague from Open Secrets, Michael Merchants, is also joining this meeting, and he will also be available to address any questions you have uh, later in the discussion part. Um, so, like I said, I will speak today about the Armstrong case here in South Africa, which is uh, which was launched by this uh, by Salk and Open Secrets in June this year, and uh, which actually seeks a judicial review of the decisions by the state granting permits that allow exports to arms exports to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. So I will give you a brief overview of the factual background, the legal framework, um, the status of the current proceedings where we stand and the challenges we face so far. Um, so before we go into that, just to give you a, like a very brief historical background. It is actually sad that I have to be here and speak about questionable South African arms trades, uh, since uh, South Africa, with its history under apartheid, should actually know better, especially with its history of irresponsible and unethical arms trades under apartheid. So, uh, and it's actually, it was actually uh, against that background that uh, the democratic South Africa established, uh, uh, renewed its domestic legal framework and renewed it to prevent uh, irresponsible arms transfers uh, from happening. So in that regard, um, a new act was established and a new committee, the National Convention on Arms Control Committee was established, which is supposed to oversee uh, arms transfers. Uh, this act actually uh, entered into force in 2003. Uh, so you can see from the date that it, South Africa at least on paper, was actually committed to the idea of responsible arms trades before the ATT actually entered into force. However, um, today the uh, reality, unfortunately, paints uh, the reality of South African arms trades uh, paints a different picture. So just to give you a brief factual background, um, between 2017 and 2020, um, the arms exports from South Africa to Saudi Arabia and the UAE contributed up to 35% of the total value of South Africa's arms exports. And uh, you can imagine that both countries are of high importance for South Africa's arms industry. And like I said, the, the entity that we are going against is the uh, National Convention on Arms Control Committee, which is in short form the NCACC, uh, which is a cabinet committee that consists of ministers. Um, so just to give you, I won't go into too much details or technicalities of the legal framework, but just to give you a brief overview, the argument that we are making with our application is actually an administrative justice argument. So the grounds for our, applica for our application, um, uh, for our review application, derive um, 
in essence from uh, the domestic legal framework, which is the NCAC Act, which I spoke about, which was established in 2003 and, and the promotion of administrative justice act. So combined, uh, these both acts are uh, forming the basis of our application. And with respect to the NCAC Act, the act that's regulating arms transfers, um, the uh, deciding entity, the NCACC, actually um, the act is stating that this committee must avoid transfers to governments that systematically violate or suppress human rights and fundamental freedoms. And that this committee also must avoid transfers of arms that are likely to contribute to the escalation of a military conflict. Um, uh, the other basis for our argument is then, of course, with respect to the power to review, uh, the power of the court of a court to review and set aside uh, administrative decision. And uh, the South African law in that regard states that um, if those uh, those kind of decisions that the uh, committee uh, granted and which allowed the uh, the export of arms, if those decisions were unlawful or unconstitutional, then these uh, decisions can be reviewed or set aside. Or if that committee actually the NCACC failed to consider relevant considerations, uh, or if the when the um, impugned decisions were just simply unreasonable or irrational. So um, it will be, it remains to be seen, but uh, the court will now have to make a decision uh, against the backdrop of the uh, available public evidence that's out there uh, with respect to a conflict in Yemen, uh, which is such as the UN experts report or um, the actually statements by the South African government in the Security Council uh, during its tenure in 2019 and 2020, where South Africa on numerous occasions actually expressed concern about the humanitarian situation in Yemen and actually called upon, on numerous occasions, called upon all parties to the conflict uh, to adhere to international law. So the court will have to take that into consideration and on this basis, we argue in our application that the NCACC, the deciding committee, uh, did actually not take all relevant considerations into account. Uh, or if it did, uh, that uh, if it did take such considerations into account, that uh, such dis decisions must be must be considered as uh, irrational or unreasonable. So. Uh, if you look in, to the, into the South African legal framework in more detail, you'll actually see that um, it is, uh, if you compare it to the ATT, it is actually uh, more restrictive uh, than the ATT uh, to the extent that it actually, for instance, uh, does not require an overriding risk as, for instance, Article 7.3. Uh, of the ATT does. So you can see that uh, the, the, the issue that we are facing here uh, is actually the implementation of the legal framework, uh, which is the major weakness of the system so far. Um, with respect to the uh, status of the current proceedings, uh, we launched our application on 3rd of June, and the application is divided uh, in two parts. Uh, so part A is an urgent application, that sought the names of the permit holders, uh, which is actually necessary under South African law, uh, uh, since any party that might have an interest in a review application, which is part B, uh, has to be given the opportunity to join the proceedings. So, uh, and alternatively, under our part A application, we also asked the court um, to grant an order requiring if, if the NCACC doesn't want to give us the names of these permit holders, these arms companies, that uh, we alternatively asked for an order that's requiring the NCACC to serve the court papers on the permit holders so that they can join the proceedings if they wish to do so. So uh, like I said, part B of the application is then the judicial review application. However, this uh, part of the application can only proceed if we have received the record. The records um, uh, under South African law uh, should actually include, um, the, for instance, the minutes of the of the committee sessions actually when they were deciding over an application to uh, grant um, a, a, an export permit uh, to an arms company. So um, on 15th June um, this year, 
we in the urgent court of Pretoria, uh, the court granted uh, our alternative relief actually, and requested the NCACC to serve the papers on all permit holders. And currently where we stand is that we are waiting for the NCACC to actually hand over the record, uh, which like I said, should illustrate whether, uh, whether and to what extent the, um, the committee, the NCACC actually engaged with the role of Saudi Arabia and the UAE in the conflict in Yemen. So, and uh, to my last point on the challenges that we face so far, um, so far these challenges were more on the factual side and evidentiary side. So um, as we, luckily we have at least the NCACC's annual reports. However, uh, those reports are backwards looking and often delayed. So there has crucial implications uh, for the litigation, especially when we want to when you want to bring an uh, application in the urgent court and actually have no information whether there are still like uh, current uh, valid per permits that allow or facilitate the uh, exports of arms. So uh, another issue that we face was that actually the, that the NCACC report does not indicate the companies which are exporting arms outside South Africa. So these are two um, challenges we face on the factual side. Um, as we are still in the very beginnings of the proceedings here in South Africa, it remains to be seen whether we will face the similar challenges as other litigants, as for instance, Hans uh, described. Uh, however, given the importance of these arms exports, for, especially for the arms industry, we, we expect a strong backlash from the opposing side. So that's it from my side for now, just to give you an overview. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks a lot, Akira. Um, the, just to warn people, my computer seems to be struggling with its um, internet connection um, at the moment. Um, and I think I'm back now, but um, you know, I'm having a few problems. So I missed some of what you had to say, Akira, unfortunately. Um, I think um, you know, I've, I'm hoping that Valentina will, will step in if I disappear on you completely, but hopefully that's not going to be a, a, an issue. Um, so thanks very much. That's the um, uh, kind of uh, the, the formal bit of the of the uh, of the event, if you like. Um, I think um, we where we need to uh, go now is obviously we need to discuss. But something that um, uh, just I should alert you to is that um, uh, we had people have registered who have been involved with all the different cases that are in the report apart from the Spanish case. And I'm not sure if all those people are on the, um, are on the call, but it's possible um, that if you've got a question about one of the other cases, then there may be someone on the call um, who can answer that in detail um, if, the, if, nobody else, if nobody else can. Um, but so I will move into the question stage now. I've had one question um, uh, from uh, Fausto from the... Um, Parliamentary Forum on Small Arms and, and Light Weapons, who's got a lot of, says he's got an awful lot of background noise. So he's asked me to um, ask the question. So let me just see if I can find him. Um, so he's got his question to the panel. Um, were any of the legal challenges referred back to the parliament or linked to any parliamentary review process of arms transfers? transfers? Have you noticed any change on the level of parliamentary involvement in arms transfers due to the legal challenges? Um, uh, over. Um, actually, um, let's hold on. If people can keep that in mind, we might take a couple of extra questions because I see we, we have a couple of hands up. So um, let's go now to, and um, yeah, participants are invited to um, unmute their microphones, turn their cameras on, and ask the, the, the questions directly. So, um, so Jeff. Uh, thanks so much, and I'm very informally dressed for this. Sorry. Uh, really interesting to hear these cases. You know, I'm following some of the ones in the United States at this point. I, I guess my question, kind of, is at the big picture level: uh, Is this now a trend um, of these sort of national cases? trying to challenge these arms sales? And is there obvious learning from one case to the next? Are, are the sort of the, 
the litigants looking at what's happening in another country and taking those as examples. That's sort of a big picture question. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and we'll take one more question um, from uh, Andrew. Andrew Woods, over to you. Hello there, Roy. Can you hear me? Excellent. And um, thank you, Roy. Thank you, Safer World. Um, thank you to all the panelists as well. It's been a real pleasure. Um, I've got a bit of a big picture question as well. It's probably more for Vito. And Vito, thank you very much for um, your presentation. We, we've heard a lot about the, the broader framework of obligations on states under international law, human rights law, uh, humanitarian law, etc. And obviously the obligation then on states to create the legal framework in order that they can fulfill those obligations in good faith. Um, under the arms trade treaty, of course, within the EU, under the EU uh, criteria, but also under the framework of all these other international obligations, states have created uh, export licensing um, legislation and frameworks for companies and individuals to abide by. Um, clearly, none of us would, would ever argue that any individual, be it in a company or an, in, uh, an individual acting alone, should ever breach international law. And if they do, knowingly, then of course they should be uh, up in front of the court and facing the consequences. The, the, the obligation on, on companies arises, of course, from the national frameworks that are introduced, as we've just discussed, in order that states can fulfill all these obligations. I'd be really grateful uh, for Vito or any of the other panelists to just join some dots for me. Is, is there anything else in your view that companies should be doing other than submitting their, their applications to governments who clearly they look to uh, probably because they have access to much greater information uh, in order to make the judgments about whether an arms transfer is actually um, permissible and indeed in the context of what we're talking about desirable. So I wonder if you could just fill in that gap because I've heard about obligations on states and then a number of other references to guiding principles etc and and what is expected in terms of principles and guidelines, but of course that's a very different status to legal obligations which arise on states. So over to you, Roy. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I probably should have um, asked people to um, introduce themselves. Um, I happen to know who the last two people are, so I can do it retrospectively. First, that was Jeff Abramson from the Forum on the Arms Trade, and then um, Andrew is from uh, Rolls-Royce. Um, so um, maybe if we um, if I flip that to Vito to start with, um, and because uh, there was one question specifically to him, and then others are welcome to come in on any of those questions um, as, they, as they choose. Vito. Yes. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Andrew, for your uh, question. It's <clears throat> very interesting and on point. So. I was talking mainly about state obligations also because when we talk about international law, uh, states are the first like addresses and the main addresses of international law, especially international human rights law. For IHL is a bit different because the addresses are also non-state actors but uh, and armed groups, but I will leave that aside. When it comes to, so that's why, first of all, we talk about what states should do. If we look at companies, what they should do, first of all, there is a whole realm of corporate social responsibility. So, and for example, the question of a human rights impact of a certain activity. Of course, this is like a discussion that is broader than the arms sale. It's, it's for any kind of um, activity because also when you talk about, for example, extraction of mineral in a certain country, the, the human rights and environmental impact that that can have is something that that would also be addressed. Uh, but staying on the question of arms sale, certainly there is companies should, for example, follow these guidelines that were developed by the UN in uh, 2011, first of all. Uh, and there are also guidelines, if I'm not mistaken, by the OECD about that. And all that 
serves as a framework for like um, uh, for companies, businesses to guide their action uh, preventively. So first of all, as I was saying, do a human rights impact uh, and then also reactively. If something happens that was unforeseen, for example, then how to react. Uh, so I would say that corporate social responsibility is one uh, one avenue, and also definitely when we are talking about a scenario of armed conflict or potential armed conflict, certainly the fact of consulting with like experts, so have an assessment that concerns the the conflict and the possible the possibility that these arms will be will be used for. Uh, um, violations of international law or war crimes, and also consult the governments on uh, if like uh, a certain export could um, cause human rights violations or, or the commission of crimes. So that's what I would have to say. Maybe the other like panels, Valentina or any of the other have like any other ideas. And I hope it was satisfactory enough. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Vito. Uh, not to forget, we've got those the the other questions that were um, that were asked. So, for example, there was the question about Parliament, and I, I could possibly just mention the UK. Um, I think it's been a bit, um, uh, or it's almost been the other way around, I guess, in that um, there was a, a special committee in the UK that looks at arms exports um, that seemed much more engaged in. Um, uh, looking at specific arms transfers and the possibility that uh, the government uh, might or might not be in breach of its obligations. Um, but in the last few years, that committee doesn't has not operated in quite the same um, way, and so it doesn't really seem to have picked up on what's been going on in the um, in the courts, particularly. But uh, anyone else would care to come in on any of those those other questions that were asked? And I must confess again, my computer broke up a little bit. Um, on when Jeff was speaking, and I didn't quite catch exactly what the what, what the question was there. Um, um, anyone want to come in on those points? I, I think Hans was that you. Yeah, I, I think I can um, say something about the triggers on parliamentary involvement. Um, well, at this moment, the arms trade, uh, let's say, legislation. Uh, it's sort of accountability is mostly a political one. So there's a limited accountability towards parliaments and in the EU towards the other member states. But you see that that's in practice, in practice uh, failing in the sense that the compliance is so bad that that sort of accountability doesn't do a lot. The court cases now have not yet got a lot of effect because uh, in, in the sense of parliamentary discussion, uh, but it's clear that um, the politicians are aware they have a problem. <laughs> but for, if I look to the Belgian case, basically the, um, we are talking about largely about companies which are state owned and which have developed a business model uh, of exporting towards Saudi Arabia uh, while completely uh, neglecting the legal framework. So, and that's of course not something that you uh, turn around in two days. So they, they are confronted with the problem and they will have to solve it. That in the report, if you look to that second challenge, that blocked uh, almost three quarters of the Belgian arms export. So it's about uh, serious economical impact um, but it's, and it's partly also what I would say to industry, take this serious. Um, there is a developing legal framework of, um, corporate accountability, and it's just not only non-binding rules, but if you, for example, see like what the Dutch courts now are saying to Shell, is they're applying that to, as an interpretation tool for their general, um, yeah. Uh, obligations um, so it's something that that is coming and will slowly uh, companies will be uh, confronted with it uh, sooner or later also and that's part of an, an, another trend the world is getting smaller it's much easier to gather evidence uh, about uh, war crimes and problems happening 
thousand kilometers uh, away from here for the one of the court cases we prepared ourselves um, a report based on video material of the, of the Houthis where we all find all that Belgian material in what I had captured from from the Saudis so it becomes uh, much more difficult to say it's a conflict a thousand kilometers far away from here and no one knows about it that's not true anymore so there's in a way uh, a lot more factual feedback and that is now turning into a feedback into into courts and into legal accountability the companies which are going to continue to to neglect that will have the same sort of problems like companies have been having with environmental legislation or you adapt or you get at a certain moment such an amount of damages and and problems and you disappear that's basically the the evolution happening when it comes to is this a trend and do we learn from other cases like the second question uh yes partly there's a learning in internally in the sense that we have been doing procedures 10 years ago and 20 years ago but the first battle was about uh getting legal standing and that we have now and now it's battling battles about uh, other elements and and for example about information the, the court cases in the report are about really challenging the licenses but there's also a whole range of court cases about information going on those go much those go much slower but they will slowly also adapt the information environment and accessibility for us to to get information about licenses if we win them of course but i think we we will be getting there slowly but it, it will take uh, still a couple of years of um, of litigation i think that's covered more or less the three questions thanks thanks Hans. and just sorry i'm keen has got uh, got something to come bring in here but just for to um let people know what's going on we've got i see we've got mike uh, lewis and ruben mccollin who've got their hands up we, you haven't been ignored um, I also think I saw Joseph Dubé's hand for a moment. So Joseph, I don't know if, um, if you've still got a question to ask, but we'd certainly be, uh, be happy to hear from you. But first of all, um, just Valentina. Oh, and, and sorry, one more thing. Um, we, this now is the formal finish time, but we started late because of what was going on in the, in the meeting. So I'm hoping people will stay with us for a bit longer, maybe till quarter past, if that's okay. Um, Valentina. <laughs> Did you say Valentina? Am I right? Not Attila. Okay, because I thought, okay. Uh, thanks. Very, very quickly, now that um, I think, Hans, you you did much of the work, uh, in fact, adding a lot of things that I hadn't thought of. Uh, but, but really, Jeff, thanks for the question. That's a really important question of the trends. But I would highlight that given that this is very much live and ongoing, there is, we are seeing a learning curve uh, uh, that, that is created through the cumulative experience of practitioners and NGOs in different contexts. It was actually really quite interesting to see the conversations um, in September 19 in person and then online since uh, develop, um, including, well, in terms of the relationship between taking criminal proceedings versus administrative proceedings, the latter being more common. Um, civil proceedings are not common at all in Europe, but interestingly, recently, the Mexican government in the US, right? So. Uh, uh, brings uh, up an interesting commercial litigation example for transboundary harm, which I think could potentially interest some in Europe, uh, where the conversation around civil proceedings was already starting. There, largely the problem in Europe is um, with uh, uh, ri cost risk uh, and also evidence, as is the case with criminal proceedings, but linked to Hans's point, evidence has been indeed, I think in relation to both end use and end users um, but also the standards of evidence that are used in different courts. One way that the pylon effect, if you will, so different courts sort of uh, uh, reinforcing and, and helping um, other courts out in terms of making a similar uh, determination specifically uh, with, in relation to, uh, to specific Saudi units, the National Guard uh, for one uh, between Belgium uh, and other jurisdictions as well. I'll also say finally, Another trend that I think is really interesting and important is again reviving 
or altogether uh, uh, inviting human rights arguments um, and the, even beyond the European Convention or international um, instruments uh, into things like good administration, access to information under the, UN, uh, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is obviously we know happening in Spain, but also in other jurisdictions. And it's a bit hard in a public event to mention specific cases because some of these are in the making. Um, Thank, but, but there's a lot more to be said about that, of course. Uh, very briefly on the role of parliaments, I see Francesco here, Italy comes to mind, and that's an interesting uh, experience of that trend where parliament uh, is inspired. But I think in everything we have heard, um, it is not a directly linked, sort of causally linked response. Uh, certainly there is a relationship there, and maybe Francesco can say, can say more to that. Um, and then finally, on corporate uh, 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 obligations, it's very much an ongoing, very emerging, and more emerging than, than any of the other um, avenues or pathways we've we've remarked upon. Um, the working group, uh, the UN working group on business and human rights, is just taking up the conversation. Defense companies were never really seriously looked at um, in the context of existing soft. Uh, law standards. Um, and indeed, I think Germany is one of the few examples where companies are even required after being licensed to come back to the licensing authority and say, look, I think there might be a problem. Should we do a review or a post uh, export control? Whereas uh, in no other jurisdictions is that really happening. But the ICC initiative is mending that gap. That's really raising stakes for uh, companies um, that have been hopeful about relying on domestically legal licenses so far. Um, so I, I think there is prospect there in shifting the conversation understandings collectively. Thanks, Valentina. Maybe if, if um, before we go to these next set of questions, um, if um, uh, uh, Francesco um, from Italy, if you have got anything that you'd like to um, add on the parliamentary side, here's your chance. Yes, thank you. Just, just a quick intervention. I, I reinforce what Valentina was saying there is not direct interchange between our legal action and the, the decision that the parliament made and then the government upheld uh, regarding first the suspension and then the rejection of some license uh, regarding specifically Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. But uh, it's undoubtedly that uh, our pressure that the, uh, on parliamentarians were stronger because of the legal action and also because of the fact that the legal action was uh, successful in, in, in not being archived because, uh, you know, maybe not everybody knows that the prosecutors asked to, um, you know, um, stop the, the, the inquiry while the judge that has to decide whether or not going uh, on or not decided to continue the inquiry and, uh, you know, made the prosecutor continue that. So we are in the new phase of the inquiries. Uh, but the, the, the interesting thing is that um, also, uh, some political decision can lead to interesting legal cases because when the government decided to scrap those uh, licenses, then it was the company that you know asked the uh, the, the administrative court to um, you know reject this decision and to cancel the, the government decision about the, the stopping of the license. Uh, and the first part of this uh, case was uh, dismissed. And the judges uh, say that the government was, you know, uh, has the, the authority to stop and revoke even past the license, but we'll see. And of course, it's all this is interesting because at least us, we are trying to insert ATT and uh, common position, the EU common position rules inside all these cases that at the first step were only about the national law. So it will be interesting how these cases will model also uh, the, you know, the licenses process and the decision in the future. Thank you for the, for the time. Thanks, Francesco. Okay, so we've got three hands up. We've got Mike and Ruben and Kaylin. Uh, so Mike, over to you. We'll take you as a bunch, if that's okay. Um, and Mike, to you. Thanks very much. Um, my name is Mike Lewis. Um, I work um, in various capacities, but I'm speaking here in, in fully in my personal capacity. Um, it was a question really just to extend the, the thought that um, Andrew's question articulated and also um, Valentina's um, response. Because large um, uh, uh, arms manufacturers 
um, involvement with weapon systems rarely ceases, at least for large and complex weapon systems at the point of sale. Um, one can envisage quite frequent situations where an, a, an arms company may indeed have more information about how a weapon system is being used than the licensing government. So kind of inverting the hierarchy of knowledge that Andrew's question um, mapped out. Now, I'm not making any allegations, of course, about Rolls-Royce or ASD Europe members or anything like that. But um, in the Saudi case, one can indeed envisage a sense in which those supporting the use of aircraft um, in the Royal Saudi Air Force have knowledge about the use of particular weapon systems in particular sorties because their, their personnel are embedded with particular RSAF units, um, that those companies you know, receive resupply requests, so know when and what is being used. Um, they're not you know, at the point of use of a weapon, but they may indeed have access to, to weapons telemetry, for example, um, for the purposes of improving the weapon systems. They may even be doing inventory management. Um, so, so given that kind of granular knowledge about how these weapon systems are being used in a particular conflict, how do the participants think that um, that knowledge affects the obligations of the companies in this process? And indeed, do they think that at some point that knowledge might cross the, the, the kind of mens rea threshold that might exist in in some forms of aiding and abetting serious international crimes and might implicate um, individual criminal responsibility. Thank you, uh, Mike. So um, we'll put that in the pocket for the moment and go over to um, Ruben. Hello, thank you for giving me the floor. Um... I'm Ruben, I'm a graduate student in Geneva and last year worked on a graduate project with Wolf, uh, Wolf exactly on arms export key stores. So I'm incredibly, incredibly excited to hear you all talk uh, on this issue. Um, I had one comment, one question, I suppose. The question is uh, where you see next steps to further uh, ATT implementation is exactly on this issue of uh, re Other people are moving, so I think maybe it's Ruben who's having the problem this time and not me. Um, can actually, people... done whether there oh, are good oh. acts. Oh, did I cut, cut out? Yeah, we had a bit of a problem with you there, Ruben. Do you want to um, I go at you? I think you got to, we've got, I've got a question and a comment, and then I can. Okay, start. okay, sorry. So, my let's hope that this is stable now. Um, so, uh, my question would be what are what do you see as next steps to ensure uh, ATT implementation uh, beyond setting up rules but are actually making sure that those rules are applied we came up last year um, that we would see a strong need to lobby um, courts to actually uh, take their uh, jurisdiction uh, seriously and not just do a checkbox uh, approach have they uh, considered this item but actually the, what is the substance of this item and how did the government evaluate that? Um, and the other point I forgot again, regardless. All right, that's all right. We'll stick with the question for now. Um, and uh, uh, Kaylin? There we go. Can ah, perfect. So my name is uh, Kaylin Malk. I'm actually a uh, graduate student at the University of York uh, in England here, uh, working on my dissertation and um, have chosen this subject uh, as a topic. Uh, my question is, I guess, sort of far reaching. Um, how do we, demand transparency from state actors in in that we like for instance the united states it has some of the most robust arms laws uh in the world and yet those arms laws are fluid um and open to interpretation depending on uh the political party in power at any given moment and agendas and things like that um so if and you know in reading and researching this topic um uh, I've even come across instances where the Pentagon has shipped thousands of weapons without um, following their own uh, regulations and, and following up on end user certificates and things like that. So 
if we can't even, you know, follow our own rules that we've established, how do we uh, enforce those rules and, and how do we really demand transparency? Because I do agree that transparency is the key to, um, you know, the issue of arms control. Thank you for taking my question. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kevin. Um, okay, so we've got a, 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 a few things there. Um, would anybody um, care to um, start? And I think given the time, um, uh, if you would like to address yourself to any of the questions that have been asked, um, but also maybe if there's any kind of closing comment um, that you might like to make at this point, that's probably the best way to um, to, to, to make this work. So um, again, possibly, um, uh, let's start with Rico, shall we? Because again, there's that, the question from Mike there. I think he might have mentioned you by um, uh, by name, but obviously others can can, can respond as well. Vito? Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, I think that, yeah, if I understood correctly, the question of knowledge of uh, by companies of, on the use of the arms as a, an element for the threshold that can cross the threshold for aiding and abetting. I think it's a rather complicated question, but I mean, uh, I would say that yes, it can be uh, an element. A lot depends on, I would say, how the weapons are used in the sense that, of course, um, I, I mean, uh, weapons are destructive, but if they are used like within the boundaries of, of law, as much destructive as they can be, uh, their use is legal. Of course, there are also weapons that can be illegal by themselves because, for example, they are indiscriminate in uh, like hitting a target. But definitely, I would say that the specific knowledge that a company can have uh, when it's... Uh, included within an arms sale to a government that you know will use it uh, in an unlawful way, then definitely it becomes an element to uh, evaluate if there is criminal liability under aiding and abetting. Of course, then the problem is to, to prove like always like the, to prove the knowledge is very difficult as a subjective element. But my broad answer would be yes to the question. And uh, as to the question on the, the next step for the ATT implementation, I would say that that's political and not legal. I think that the treaty is there. You could amend the treaty and include an enforcement mechanism, but this is not something likely to happen, I would say. So it's, it's about the political process. It's about working at the uh, advocacy level, at the the national level, maybe at the regional level, for example, the European Union, maybe there to have like a mechanism for the implementation, for example, of the common position or for the uh, to do to to bring also cases in, in court based on that. Uh, but definitely, I think that the next steps are definitely political and, and not legal. Um, thanks, Peter. I think, uh, uh, Valentina, any, any uh, responses to those questions and final closing comments? Yes, these, these are demanding final um, selective comments, but just linked to, to Vito's point. So I, of course, agree there that uh, criminal determinations or criminal liability determinations are extremely hard uh, to make out. Uh, in this case, it's almost prohibitively Restrictive. Um, Roy, I think your microphone is a little bit noisy. Thank you. Um, and um, just just recall again the significance of some of the other uh, ways in which responsibility uh, is uh, um, triggered uh, through these these relationships. Uh, and these transactions, which includes, as, as Vito also discussed, state responsibility. And there, the question of complicity is one that isn't limited to adjudication by courts and can be adjudicated by political bodies, by other states, um, and, and can have considerable consequence. Um, so I think also in terms of next steps, it is mobilizing not just courts, um, of course, continuing to mobilize courses, many ways in which we haven't done so, 
um, uh, and, and civil, civil litigation being one of them, uh, but uh, also looking to international bodies, be it human rights mechanisms, political bodies, and so forth to uh, empower them to step in uh, to provide some form of international overs oversight in the absence of an ATT mechanism. This is possible given that broader environment for the ATT, which we started off with. Um, but there's, of course, much more to be said and done to that effect. Um, Valentina, um, uh, Hans, any thoughts, Close, uh, answers to those questions, closing thoughts? Um, yeah, maybe. For the, for the last question, it's like how do we demand transparency and at the same time also ATT implementation? Because for me, it's part of the implementation will be how the domestic um, le legislation or framework uh, develops around it. Um, I think one important thing is that um, we have to see it also in the context of human rights law and how that, that develops. Um, one thing which has not been brought up a lot in the, in the litigation, but will uh, probably come one way or another, is um, EU, I'm talking for EU context now, is the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. And there are elements of the uh, Strasbourg Court, which can be applied in that EU context in a much wider way, because the, uh, the difference with the Strasbourg Court is there is a clear jurisdictional limit um, but that doesn't apply within the EU context. But the general obligations uh, do apply. And if we look to the right of life, it's about uh, a duty to uh, deal with uh, life-threatening situations, which includes not just legislation, but also sufficient control. And also implication of, of possibly affected uh, uh, groups in there. And there, I think, in the future will be one that will be one trend to start developing arguments about what is that sufficient control and what sort of transparency do you need and so on and that's also that there are also things which can be pushed towards the european court of justice and then it's about implementation of those att obligations but also of the general human rights uh, framework within uh, the european union or within eu law um, so that the, the element of positive obligations, which is connected to human rights law, gets uh, quite a lot ignored uh, at this moment in the arms control discussions, but it's something that can be uh, litigated. I have no clue how that works in the US or other legal contexts, but it's not some, uh, the, pos the whole idea of positive obligations is not something exclusively European, so that also ex exists in human rights law in general. So there should be um, avenues as well. Thanks, Hans. Um, so maybe to uh, Attila for any final thoughts that you might have, and then back to, to Sabine to um, possibly a little bit of get, get what's, uh, let's find out what's been on her mind during the, uh, the conversation. Attila. Yeah, sure. Thanks so much, Roy. Uh, I think with respect to the issues that we face, uh, whether that's the ATT implementation or the lack of transparency, which is like a, a common pattern, I think, uh, wherever you look in, this, in the countries where litigations are happening, I think um, the solutions um, are political and legal. Um, so, uh, for instance, if we, um, if we litigate a case, I think Going back to the first question raised by Jeff, it was, I think, uh, it is important to look at other cases, of course, and uh, learn from those cases as well. I can only speak for our case, for instance, uh, where we, are, uh, where we um, learned a lot from the UK case, uh, which was a similar litigation there, so, and learned a lot in terms of the standard of evidence and uh, what can we, or how, to what extent a court might be willing to um, um, uh, intervene in the decision-making process. So uh, from that same point of view, I think there are common patterns and the solutions for these kind of patterns that we see, whether that's in the industry or whether that's uh, the, the regulating bodies, uh, that those solutions there are uh, political and legal. So 
those are my final remarks. Thanks. Thanks. Um, to that. And so, yeah, interesting the this crossover between different different um, jurisdictions. And I think that, I think that's a question I'm curious to know about. And so, for, for the countries within the EU, how much, given that they've also got the EU common position overarching, how much of what is going on in court in one country might end up playing into what happens in other countries. But um, but over to Sabine. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I only uh, I wanted in closing to to extend our gratitude for this very interesting conversation. Uh, I've learned a lot about the legal cases, uh, much more than I knew before. Um, from a political perspective, I can only attest that, at least in my country, the court case has definitely um, raised the profile of the ATT and of arms export control, uh, thereby feeding into the parliamentary debate and has definitely also had an effect on our policy. So in that uh, sense, do continue your good work and keep feeding our policy. Um, I can also attest that these cases are being discussed, for example, between EU countries. Uh, because we want to learn from each other and it does provide an insight into how the ATT and in the EU, the common position is being applied. Um, one lesson I'm taking away to our capital is transparency, transparency, transparency is key. So we'll go back and we'll see what else we can do in terms of transparency. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, um, Sabine. Um, so that pretty much wraps it up. I'd like to thank the people who have um, stuck with us. Um, we have uh, uh, taken a little longer than we might have done. Um, again, I need to thank Switzerland and Germany for, for um, funding the work that we're doing. The Netherlands for, for, um, for, for co-sponsoring to the panelists and also to all the contributors and reviewers um, in the report and, that's, uh, and to, the, to the ICJ and to my fellow authors, there's Valentina, but there's also Carlo Mazzolini, who was, uh, who was one of the authors to the report as well. Um, so I hope uh, this has been useful, um, and it does. There's kind of a couple of those closing comments sounded quite encouraging. I thought that there was a, you know, we are building up ahead of steam. There is some momentum here, which is was useful. I would encourage you to have a look at the report. Um, yes, it's quite big, but it's a stonking good read. Um, and there's a and the cases, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of kind of page turning stuff in there on the cases, and then some interesting stuff which is comparing the different challenges that existed in, 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 in those different kind of jurisdictions, et cetera. Um, we'd welcome further questions or comments once you've had a look at the report. Um, and uh, just, I guess, I guess, finally, my final point um, before we close would be that we, you know, um, I don't think anyone wants to take governments or companies to court. Um, it's a horrible, painful, slow, tortuous, obstacle ridden path. Um, what we want is for states to be acting in such a way that it doesn't lead lawyers and activists and human rights defenders and so on to say, this is, governments aren't doing what, what it says they're supposed to do, what they've said they're supposed to do, and nothing else is stopping them. So we're forced to end up in a legal situation. So, um, uh, that's the, the message to governments, if uh, any governments uh, that are left here now, is, um, is don't make us do this. Um, and uh, that's it. Um, I wish you a good evening. Um, if you are following the CSP this week, I um, uh, wish you good luck with that, and I hope it goes well. Thank you all very much for, um, for participating, um, and goodbye. <laughs>